We got Anthony Ruggiano Jr. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. It, likewise, we've all been uh, yes. excited to see you ever since you and I had dinner uh, back when with there was Larry Mazza, his beautiful uh, wife, your daughter Tony Lee, right. Johnny, Eli, and hey, Mike Dowd. Mike Dowd, what a group, man! <laughs> what a crew! <laughs> what a crew, man! Yeah. And it was, it was, you know, I got lost in the conversation with you guys and. It was just such a great evening, but I, I had to remind myself, I was around a bunch of killers. Yes, killers. at one time, for sure. Yeah, it's funny you said that because, you know, even I, I, I grew up around them, you know, and people ask me that question all the time, how do I feel so comfortable around people that killed people? And I say, because I grew up with them. You know, it's just a crazy thing. And, and when, you, when you sit down with some of these just stone cold killers, they're some of the most charming people, right? Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah, the friendliest, the most helpful, but you know, that's what they do. Right. Now, Anthony, you, you your father, Fat Andy Ruggiano, is a heavy name in the streets. Rest in peace to your father. And uh, he, he carried such a heavy name back then. And your early memories of him, uh, what type of father was he to you? Was he a, a good father or was he, was he violent towards you? No, he was a very... It's as crazy as he was very affectionate. He was a very no. He was a great father. I mean, he um, he never like I guess you could say he never took his job home with him. <laughs> you know, like uh, <laughs> um, he you know came to all our little league games. Um, he taught us you know how to play baseball. He taught us how to box. He hung a heavy bag up in my garage and he took us out there. He took us to sporting events. He was very. My father loved sports, music, and food. Right. And he introduced us to all those three things. He took us to prize fights at a young age. He took us to Yankee Stadium yes. at a young age. Now, he was an excellent father um, when he was home. But, you know, he wasn't home, you know, and then he would leave and be gone for a day or two, you know. So there was always, there was always some uncomfortability. Like, it was always like, when are you going to be back? There was always some, you know, like, don't leave, you know, that sort of stuff. Because And, and I always knew that, Something was different about my father than, ever, than other people's fathers. I felt that at a young age, you know, like because when I would go by my friends' houses or even my own cousins' houses, and I would see how their family operated. Like the father came home at a certain time, left at a certain time, they ate dinner at a certain time. Like that wasn't sort of going on in my house. So when my father was home, he was very affectionate, very you know, t did a lot of activities with us. I guess because he maybe had a little guilt with the times that he wasn't around. So I always knew there was something different going on, but I really never knew what. And even, it's funny because even when I went to school, and you know, when you're a kid, you go to school and the teachers say, tomorrow we're gonna talk about what your fathers do for a living. Right. You know, cause back then only the fathers worked. Today, everybody works, but back then, and, and I would go home and I would tell my father, dad, tomorrow we're gonna talk about what our fathers do for a living, you know, and he used to tell me, that he worked in a dry cleaners. Right, and yeah. you're like, why do you wear a hand painted yeah. tie and a and, suit? You know, <laughs> but so I'm, I'm a little kid and I knew that wasn't true. I didn't know what was true, but I didn't. I knew that wasn't, And but I would roll with it. You know, I would go to school the next day and say, my father works in a dry cleaners, you know? And the reason why I used to say that is because he was on the books. He, he A guy around him owned dry cleaners and he was on the books at these dry cleaners for income tax purposes. Right. So that's why he would say he worked in the dry cleaners. So, but I knew that was bullshit, you know, I knew that, but I rolled with it. But he was a good father and uh, he was a good, uh, a good uncle, he was a good son. I mean, he was a good family man. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I could tell you're a great fa family man. The way you, you interact with your daughter, Tony Lee, you brought her to a, <laughs> you know, a Dua Lipa concert. Yes. I mean, I saw the warmth, I felt it. 
and and that's that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. And that's what it's supposed to be about, right? The La Cosa Nostra was about brotherhood and family, yeah, right? It used to, at one time it was. I mean, it, it's not like that today, but definitely at one time it was definitely like that. I mean, you know, when when I was coming up, you know, when I was a kid and I would go with my father to, you know, his clubs and, you know, it was always a lot of, you know, Everybody was tight, you know, the, we, we all went to, you know, they all baptized each other's kids. They all, you know, went, you know, to each other's birthday parties. I mean, it was very family oriented uh, when I was younger. And eventually that sort of, right, you know, drifted away. Did your mother know your, your, your father was a big mafioso? <laughs> it's funny you said that because my mother always used to deny that. So my mother, see, my, 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 my father wasn't straightened out yet when he met my mother he was he was my he met my mother my mother was only 18 in coney island he met my mother at a at a, um at a beach bar and it's funny because my mother went there with her girlfriend who had a date with this guy lenny Dedone, who actually baptized me and lenny Dedone's uncle was happy mayoni who was an original member of murder inc wow so her girlfriend had a date with lenny and she, my mother went with her, and Lenny was at this bar with my father, and Lenny and my mother's girlfriend introduced my father and my mother to each other. And um, so my father had gotten up to go to the men's room, and this other guy came over and started talking to my mother, and told my mother, who are you here with? She goes, I'm here with some jerk named Andy. And the guy got all nervous and walked at Andy, oh, and, he, and he like walked away. So that was my mother's first little inkling, but she, yeah, but he wasn't straightened out yet. He was actually working on an A&P truck when he met my mother because he was on parole. Okay. But then later on, she found out. Right. She found out. But uh, yeah, she she was sort of in denial of it, my mother. But she knew. Yeah, she knew. Yeah, she knew. But she it, knew. Italian women are, yeah. they're down for she this. She used to tease us and say, I don't know. And they used to say he was a button guy. I thought like he sold <laughs> buttons. And my, it's like, come on, what are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> No, that's interesting. And the way your, your your fat Andy got made and got introduced to the mob was he was jacking Charlie Wagons' uh, gambling dens, right? right? Yeah. So when he came out of prison, he was a kid and him and Tony Lee were partners and they had no money. You know, they were they were, you know, they were piss poor. You know, they came from poverty. My father came from poverty. And uh so yeah, he had no job. He was working on an AP truck just to because he was on parole. But you know, that was he he was and on the side, him and Tony Lee were robbing poker games because they were renegades. They knew that they were mobbed up, but you know, he he was just a he was just a wild kid, my father. And uh and they were robbing poker games and they happened to rob Charlie Wagon's poker game. And um, you know, Charlie sent for this guy Albert Mayoni, who was happy Mayoni, like I said earlier, a member of Murder Inc. was his brother, because that that crew, Murder Inc. was out of my father's neighborhood, East New York, Bronzeville, that, that was that crew. That was that was there. And um, so he asked Albert, who's this kid Andy? And Albert said, um, he's Liberty's bro kid brother. Liberty was my uncle Frank, but his nickname was Liberty. And they everybody knew my uncle. So um Charlie goes, Liberty's kid brother. He goes, This kid robbed my poker game. Is do you think you could get the money back? And Albert, you know, and I heard this story many times throughout my life, even from Albert, the original Albert Mayoni. And he said, you know, and he left and he goes to Charlie, this kid ain't going to give you back the money. He goes, either you could kill him or give him a job, but you ain't never getting the money back. Forget about that. So Albert went to my father and said, Charlie wants to meet him. So my father went there with Tony Lee, who waited outside with, a, with two guns. And my father went into Charlie's bar and uh, Albert introduced him and, uh, Charlie actually gave him a job driving him, driving him around. They asked him if he had a driver's license and if he was willing to, you know, if he wanted a job. And uh, he gave my father a job. You know, Charlie knew my father had potential then, you know what I mean? I guess, and Charlie gave him a job. To have the balls to rob a mafia yeah, poker and, game, I mean, right. that you're either dead or you're respected. Right, yeah, because my father knew the deal. My father knew about the mob. He wasn't he wasn't naive to what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he really didn't give a shit, you know what I mean? And Charlie knew that. And Charlie knew, you know, he had a good pedigree, my Uncle Liberty and everything, so Charlie gave him a job. Right. And it was good for Charlie. Charlie had no kids. The only one, you know, Charlie was just part, Charlie had his brother Danny. He was another wise guy. So it was a good move for Charlie because here's a 23-year-old kid that's got balls to rob games. He has potential. Right. 
Now, this is Murder, Inc. days. This is Albert Anastasia. This is a whole level, different level. Now, that eventually matriculated when Carlo Gambino showed up on the scene. And I, I, I think you mentioned to me, your father said Carlo Gambino was one of the most intelligent men he's right. ever met. My father always used to tell me the toughest guy he ever met was Albert Anastasia, and the smartest guy he ever met was Carlo Gambino because he dealt with both of them. I mean... Uh, when, so when he would started driving with Charlie, you know, Charlie, of course, that was Charlie's family, which was the Mangano family at the time, you know, um, and Albert Anastasia was the boss. And then Charlie, like I talked about other times, Charlie asked my father if he would be willing to, you know, clip somebody, you know, uh, and without asking any questions. And my father said, yeah. And then my father actually did commit a homicide with Charlie and his brother, Danny. Uh, it's funny because my father told me the story that, they picked him up at his mother's house because he he lived he still lived home with his mother, you know he still lived home with his mother and they picked him up. Charlie picked him up with a guy in the car and Danny the brother Danny was in another car, and uh, he got in the car he said and Charlie pulled away from my grandmother's house and my father said, I leaned over and I whispered in his ear and I didn't know what he meant at the time and I said whispered in his ear what do you mean he went like this, with his hand. Wow. You know, so then I knew what he meant. And uh, that was the beginning. You know, that was the beginning. And then uh, Albert started calling him the kid. That was his nickname with Albert Anastasia. Albert Anastasia took a liking to him. Then he brought Tony Lee into the picture, his partner. He brought his partner into the picture. And he started doing a lot of things for Albert Anastasia. And in 53, the books were closed and he was a special case to get made. And um, and they sent his name around. And uh, like I said earlier, Tony the Sheik, who was at the time a wise guy with the Genovese family, who later on became a very powerful captain, um, put a beef in because my father robbed his poker game. He and, didn't want Fat Andy to get made. Right. He thought he was an animal because my father, plus, you know, he did. He knew he knew about a couple of homicides my father committed. And, uh, you know, so he put a beef in and they had to sit down in the city with Albert Anastasia, Tony the Sheik, a couple of guys, Charlie. Me and my father had to sit at another table. But he heard, overheard everything, and uh, Tony the Sheik told Albert Anastasia that this kid's an animal, and he don't, he shouldn't get straightened out. He has no respect. He's an animal. And my father said Albert Anastasia didn't say a word. Just, just sat there and listened. And then finally, when Tony the Sheik stopped talking, he said Albert Anastasia just looked at him and says, "Well, who do you want me to straighten out, priests?" <laughs> right. And like that was the end of the conversation. And then my father got straightened out. And then. Uh, he proposed Tony Lee, and Tony Lee got straightened out in 56, and then in 57, Albert uh, was assassinated. Albert Anastasia. Yeah. Yeah. But Al uh, your father was really on record with Albert Anastasia's crew by way of Charlie Waggins, right? Correct. Charlie oh, Waggins okay. brought my father into the picture. He proposed him. Charlie Waggins actually proposed my father and John Gotti. John Gotti and my father actually got made by the same soldier by the same wise guy charlie wagons who later on became a captain also they a, a lot of charlie wagons really straightened out a lot of people he straightened out my father he straightened out john Gotti, genie Gotti, um the johnny whole, caniglia he straightened i mean he straightened out what so, about danny marino was he's, danny marino was what with, with carmine Lamendoza. that was a different okay. crew that was in the same family but a different crew right yeah. now why'd they call him charlie wagons what was the backstory he he, on that? he he at one time when he was a kid he was actually a tattoo artist in coney island and i think it had something to do with maybe you know when him he when him being a tattoo artist and i remember when i was a kid because i knew him since I was a little kid, before I met other wise guys, like I didn't know he was a wise guy. He just was, I knew, and and he um, he had a lot of tattoos, and he was he was actually a tat he had a, a a stand in Coney Island when tattoos were legal, and no he kidding. was a tattoo artist. What did the mob think of getting tattoos? What did Fat Andy say about tattoos? Well, he hated tattoos. He hated them. He said they were nothing but big fingerprints. Yeah, he hated them. When I got my first tattoo when I was a kid, he like flipped out on me. He ripped, get? He ripped get the shirt Anthony? off. I had so what happened was I, I got a it was they were illegal in New York, so I went it's funny, it's a funny story because what happened was I um I my friend Sal wanted to get a tattoo, so I went with him to this guy's house in this guy's basement and he got his tattoo and then the guy I saw this like rose and I told the guy and I got the rose on my arm with mom and dad in it to try to like pacify my father <laughs> right. and, I, and I hit it 
And then one day I heard my mother say, you better go check your son. He's sleeping with pajama tops on. He's hiding something on his arms and maybe he's taking drugs. So my oh, father geez. came in the bedroom and the um, and he and I, he picked up my sleeve. I made out I was sleeping and he saw the tattoo. And he when he told my mother, that son of a bitch got a tattoo. So when I, I when I made out, I woke up, I walked into the kitchen and he was I mean, he was mad. He he ripped his shirt. He went, you see any tattoos on me? They're nothing but big fingerprints. He's, and I, I'm like, I'm like 15. Like I'm sitting there. He goes, they're nothing but big fingerprints. 20 years later, true story. 20 years later, I'm in a funeral. And the funeral parlor is packed. And a guy walks up to me, an old guy. I don't even recognize the guy. And he walks up and he says to me, do you have a rose tattoo on your right arm? How the fuck do you know I got a rose tattoo? I he goes, how do you know I got a rose tattoo on my right arm? He goes, because I'm the guy that gave it to you. He goes, I didn't know you were Andy's son. They were looking all over Queens for me. They were going to kill me that I gave you a tattoo. He goes, I, if I, he, he, I said, why? He goes, I didn't know who you were. He goes, I, they were going to, people were looking all over Queens for me. That who tattooed, who tattooed Andy's son. Yeah, that, that's a trip. <laughs> but your your dad's right, man. A lot of these gangsters are getting tattoos, and all the cops do is photograph yeah. them, and you're cataloged. And well, that's it. I, all my, you know, all the when I got arrested and I went to prison, all my tattoos are photographed. You know, my palms, my prints. I mean, they took prints. They take. That's amazing what they do. Yeah, your first bid, you did what two and a half years? You had a the first bid I did was in '78. I did two and a half years in 1978. Yeah. I came out in '81. And then I went away again in 91. I did 16 months. Fed or state? No, th those two were state. And then the third time in 96, I went away on a state bid. But while I was in state prison, I got indicted in Miami by the feds. Oh, wow. And then I went down there and I got 10 years. And then I went back. I finished my state time. And then I did another five years with the, with the feds. Where'd you do your state time at? Rikers? Some of it at Rikers, then I went upstate. I was in Dannemora. I was in so many prisons. Dannemora, Clinton, um, Comstock, Elmira, Arthur Kill, Marcy. I was in Otisville. I was in a lot of prisons. And how was it for an Italian with the brothers and the Spanish kids? Did they, did they give you any trouble or they knew your pedigree? No, they, they knew our pedigree. We, we, basically, the Italian guys in there were like aligned with the Latin kings. Uh, mostly, like we use their phones. You know, if you if they knew you were all right and you had somebody in the street, like it, it, you you know, I never had any issues. I mean, that, I was lucky because, of course, I was Fat Andy's son, so I had like a little bit of a reputation. So any wherever jail I went to, people knew I was coming and they were like waiting for me when I got there, like with you know with shower slippers and you know all the little little necessity. care packages. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like a sandwich. You know, so so I I I pretty much um, I was okay. So never, your time was uh, was done rather rather peacefully. You didn't have any beefs or any bullshit. I mean, I had some arguments, you know, yeah. bullshit arguments with a couple of guys. I never, you know, I had a couple of fist fights, but, you know, nothing crazy, you know, nothing out of the ordinary, no stabbings or no riots or nothing like that. But, you know, I, I was okay. Yeah. You know, I, listen, I, 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 you know, there's, 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 uh, there's, there's, Three cardinal rules in, to, that you live by in prison. If, and if you if you don't break any of, of those cardinal rules, you're gonna you know it, it's gonna it's gonna be safe. You know. Uh, so there's the three cardinal rules, and I, I don't I don't want to be you know I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. So there's three cardinal rules. Mm -hmm. One is no drugs. No drugs. The second one is no gambling. Mm -hmm. And the third one is no homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is if you do drugs and you own money, you're going to get hurt. You're dead. If you gamble and you don't pay, you're going to get hurt. And as far as the homosexuality, people in there are doing forever. And they get married in there and they have relationships in there with, with you know, with gay men. So now if you're going to just go out with a gay guy and just you know, have a fling in jail, you know, you're going to get killed. You'll get killed right. over that. So if you don't break those three rules, you're you know, good. you're going to be pretty good. Because when I went to, when I was in Attica and I went to the parole board, a lot of state prisons, guys get cut on their face with razors. Right. 
And the parole guy is looking at me like this, and he's looking at me, and he says to me, how come you don't have no scars on your face? I said, why should I have scars on my face? He says, oh, excuse me, your reputation precedes you? I says, no, maybe because I'm a little intelligent, and there's no reason and you for me to have scars right. on my yeah. face. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. No, I hear you. Mm. But that that's interesting. Now, you, you, you told a story about when you went to prison, they threw a party for you at a social oh, club. Yeah. What was that experience like, so Anthony? So in 78, I had to turn myself in. So I, I, I was out on an appeal bill and I lost my appeal. So they gave me a date to surrender. So before I surrendered, my father took me to the Ravenite. That was on Neil De La Croce's club, who was the underboss of the Gambino family at the time. And they had a big party for me, a going away party. We wore suits and ties and I went there and they had like a big buffet of food and the place was packed. I mean, all the wise guys were there and captains. Uh, Neil was there. And, you know, it was like I was going off the car. I mean, it was like a movie scene. <laughs> you know, I walked in. Everybody's patting me on the back, hugging me, kissing me, you know, telling me don't worry, schooling me. Like, they take me in the back. They sit me down at Neil's table. And Neil tells me, if anybody tells you anything, just send their name out to us. Don't make friends with nobody till we give you an okay. And they gave me this whole big schmeal. And uh, it was like I was going off to college. Like I was <laughs> they going laid to the Harvard. game down for yeah, you. It was, like a, it was like New Year's Eve. It was crazy. Instead of Penn State, it was a state pen. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. I went to Dynamora. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, now w w w a lot of the, in terms of, besides Fat Andy, name another mobster that kind of laid the game down to you, that kind of coached you, groomed you, told you about, the, the ways of La Cosa Nostra. Was there another uh, influential figure in your life? Oh, that has to, has to be my father's partner, Tony Lee. Tony he Lee. Was, he was, uh, you know, they were, they were like two peas in a pod. You know, when I started actually working for my father when I was 16, when I actually got out of school and started working for me legally, Tony Lee sat me down, and, 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 I, and I talked about this before. He told me, before you commit to this life, he says, go to take your girlfriend, Alice, and go to Washington, D.C., and look at the Justice Department building, he told me. He goes, and just know that that whole, that building, that whole building is going to chase you your whole life. I didn't do it. I didn't go, but he was right. They chased me my whole life. Do you remember seeing agents watching you? Was that a normal thing? A All the time. Even my father, you know, when I was a kid, my father was under investigation and my father would actually walk outside and tell them, I'm going to leave in an hour. I'll be, and they used to just stare at me, they used to knock on their car window. It was just the way of life. That's comedy. They right? followed, yeah. yeah, they followed me, us all over. They were following us all over, taking pictures of us um, yeah. at funerals. I mean, you know, it was just, yeah. a, it was just the way of life. So they were always around. You always knew they were there. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And we used to get worried that, you know, investigations were coming down and arrests were coming down. So so we we, we knew pretty much like stuff was going on. How, how'd the mob get anything done with these guys up your ass? I mean, did you <laughs> were you were you like told not to talk on the phone, obviously? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have to do what just I mean, you know, I I, I I would use code names. I can, you know, I, I would like, if I, if I had a sports business, I would use code names. We would go meet late at night. You know, we would meet, you know, just try to avoid them. You know, just try to do things when they're not around, you know, in the middle of the night, go, uh, you know, and, and go on trains. We would go on right. trains. You know, we would just do stuff to just to, to try to avoid them. Right. And when you were active in the streets, Rouge, were you toting a pistola all the time, or was that something? No, I never, yeah. never, never carried a gun. My father didn't believe in carrying guns unless you were going to use them. Okay. Never. I mean, there was always we we had them, but we never like you know when, whenever like I know whenever we had them, there was an issue. Okay, so yeah. that wasn't a day to day thing. It wasn't. No, but, I mean, some people did like Ronnie One Arm, my friend Ronnie yeah. One Arm. I don't know if you ever heard of Ronnie Not One Arm. Sure. Yeah. yeah, he was a captain. He always had a gun on him. Right. I mean, you know, he had one arm. He had one arm. <laughs> yeah. Like, but he he always had a gun, and 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 you know, and luckily he did always have a gun on him because it saved his life. Because one night he was getting stabbed up by two guys, and if he didn't have a gun on him, they would have killed him. Right. You know? So, uh, but he always had a. So there were certain people that always had guns on them, but me personally, no, because my father always schooled us not to do that. You know. Right. And you know, as you as you kind of progressed in deeper into the LCN and and you know you 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 were running around some some heavy hitters and John Gotti senior being a contemporary a guy that came up with your father 
he always had a liking for you. Tell us a little bit about John Gotti Seniors and your relationship. Well, so when I ventured off my block when I was a kid, like when I was like around 13, uh, I ventured off my block in Queens in Ozone Park. Hey, this is Anthony Ruggiano Jr. and you're watching Cinemills TV. Wise Guy Social Clubs in my neighborhood, which there was quite a few of them. And I already knew Charlie Wagons my whole life because he strained out my father, and he had the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club on 101st Avenue. So my father naturally took me there, and John was there, and I, that's when my first introduction to John Gotti Sr. was when I was around 13, and my father introduced me to him, say, this is my son Anthony, I'm about to you know, look out for him. And, uh, and, uh, and then I started running into him in the neighborhood. You know, when I would run by the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, they would throw me money, $5, $2, yeah, go get a pizza, kid. You know, they were always throwing money at me. And um, he actually knew my father from when he was a teenager, when because he, he lived in the Bronx. Then he moved to East New York, which was my father's neighborhood. And when he moved to East New York, my father was like a big guy in East New York then. So all these street kids, they looked up to my father. And, uh, and he was one of them kids. And he actually could have been with my father, but he had a conflict. This Nicky Carraza, who was with my father, and John had like a beef, like friction, like who was going to be the leader of the gang of kids that they ran with. And they had some friction and my father sided with Nikki. So Nikki went with my father and John winded up going with Charlie Wagons. But they always respected right. my father. And what about Angelo Quack Quack? He tell was us. always in the picture. Yes. Yeah, he was always in the picture. He loved my father. He's told my father everything. So, And I met him the same time I met uh, John. I met Jeannie. And uh, my relationship started developing with him as I got older. You know, I, I would always be in the Raven Eye. He would be in the Raven Eye. Um, and it's funny because um, even in 1978, I remember I was I had to turn myself in on that case that they had that big party. And the day I went to turn myself in, I went to get a haircut. I don't know. I was a kid. I was 23 years old. And to the, in this place called Father and Son. And who walked in to get a haircut? John Gotti and Angelo Quack Quack walked in. And here I am. I'm sitting there. And John says to me, what are you doing? Don't you got to turn yourself in today? I said, yeah, this afternoon. He goes, what are you doing here? I said, I'm get, getting a haircut. He goes, get out of here and go <laughs> home to your wife. What are you, crazy getting a haircut? And, you know, they were laughing. He paid for my, my haircut. That's but he true. was always, you know, so out of respect for my father. And I think he always liked the fact that I was a convict. I think he always liked the fact that even though I was Fatty Andy's son, I was getting pinched. I was in the street. I was working in crap games that he would come to. I was writing numbers. You know, like I, I was in, I was in the in the mix. Like I was in the, you know, I was in the street. You know, right. I, and, and and I think he liked that, and uh, and he respected me for that. And um, we were both Scorpios for some reason. That meant something <laughs> to him. You know, his birthday's October twenty seventh. My birthday's October 29th. So for some reason that you know, tickled his fancy. We were both Scorpios. And uh, and he was a Yankee fan. I was a Yankee fan. He loved the racetrack. I loved the racetrack. So he always looked out for me. Um, he always helped my father. When my father was sick in prison, he had cancer. They, they you know, him and Tony paid 25000 for my father's operation. Right. You know, and he said, you know, no friend of mine's going to die in prison wow. if I could help it. Um, he loved my mother. He always looked out for my mother. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, I had a great relationship with him. When you came out of rehab, right, he shot you a few fuzzles. He bought you a new Cadillac. No, it wasn't a Cadillac. What was it? Okay. So, um, I, you know, he knew I had an issue with, he, like I said, he always looked out for me, and he never abused me. He never yelled at me. I mean, even when he was mad at me, he, 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 was, he was good to me. And um, so I was in treatment. I got out of treatment on a Wednesday, and I went to see him that, that Saturday. He used to hold court in the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. Every Saturday, he would have lunch when he was the boss. So I went there Saturday to see him with Tony Lee, and he took me outside. And he asked me, he goes, how you doing? I said, I'm doing all right. He says to me, you got a beat. I said, I don't know if I got a beat, but I'm going to give it my best shot. You know, I, And he goes, well, I don't want you stressed out. He said just like that. I don't want you stressed out, so is there anything I could do for you? So I says, well, I don't have a car right now. He goes, you don't have a car? I go, no, I got, you know, my car got, I, I, I don't have a car. He says, um, all right. So we went back inside. He made a phone call and he tells me, go to 84th Street and Atlantic Avenue. There's a car lot there. And there's for this guy named Anthony. And he's waiting for you. So I said, all right. So Tony takes me there. I walk in the car lot. The guy says to me, I said, you Anthony? He goes, yeah. I said, I, he goes, take, 
Take whatever car you want. So now, of course, I'm looking for a Cadillac now, right? I'm right. going to take any car I want, right? So, so I'm looking around, and I and I couldn't find the Cadillac, but I saw this beautiful, nice white four-door Bonneville, white, beautiful car, saddle interior, gorgeous. Back in the day, the Bonnevilles, they were they were great. So I said, I like that car. So I get it. I drive out. I leave. I go back to the Bergen Club with the car to show John the car. He goes, oh, nice car. He's looking at it. Thank you. And he says to me. He hands me money. He goes, here. He goes, listen, here's $2,000. He says, I want you here every Saturday with $100. He said, and don't, and he pointed at me with his finger. He said, don't disappoint me. I said, you got it. I went back the next week. I gave him 100 I went back the week after that. I gave him 100 I went back the third week. We go for another walk. And he says to me, how you doing? I said, I'm doing great. And I was doing good. You know, I was looking better. I had nice clothes on. I was, you know, I, I'm clean now like a month. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm feeling good. I'm back in the street, you know, like, and uh, and and he says to me, all right. He goes, how much you owe me? I says, well, I owe you 1700 right now. He goes, okay, well, keep it as a gift, he told me. Wow. You know, like, that's how he was. You know, that's why, you know, people want me to talk bad about the guy. And I have nothing bad to say about the guy. You know, he listen, he was who he was. You know, right. there's no sugar cone. He was a killer. He was a heroin dealer. He was, you know, he 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 was whatever he was, but he was my friend. Right. And and that's something John Alide mentioned. He said, when John Gotti loved you, he loved you. But do not cross that man. You know, that was the takeaway from the John Gotti feel. You know, with me, it was like how I saw him was right was right and wrong was wrong. You know, and if you were right, you were right. If you were wrong, you were wrong. And like we had some mutual things and he we had some mutual respects. And of course, you know, I was Fat Andy's son. You know, I'm not sure. saying that didn't help, but sure. but on a personal level, you know, we had some personal conversations. Like, you know, we like, you know, one time, one time we were in um, Peter Luger's best oh. steakhouse ever, by ever. the way. Yeah, yeah, in Williamsburg, and um, and we come out of now. My brother had a really major marijuana business. Your brother Albert. My brother Albert had a major marijuana business, so. We come out of Peter Lugas and his, my father was there and uh, he wasn't the boss yet, John. He was just a captain then. And we come, but everybody still wanted to be up his ass. You know what I mean? So we come out of Peter Lugas and there's a whole, there's like 10 of us and we had like three different cars and he looks at my father and he says, listen, I'm going to take your son back with me and him. I want to talk to him, just the two of us. So my father looks at him and goes, my, he goes, yeah. And I'm going like, what the fuck does this guy want with me, right? So we get the car, we get in the car. And, and he's driving, and I'm sitting there, and it's just me and him in the car. And he, and he tells me, he says to me, uh, so, I hear you and your brother are big marijuana dealers selling loads of marijuana in Manhattan, in Brooklyn. I'm going, <laughs> and I'm looking at him, I'm going, big marijuana dealers? I go, what are you talking about, right? He goes, yeah, he goes, I have more informants than the FBI, he tells me. <laughs> I go, yeah, well, I'm not one of them. He goes, well, what then I said, I know who told you that this kid, I had a beef with this kid, Johnny Garino, who unfortunately got murdered. Mm. Um, he's dead now. And I knew I had a beef with him. And I knew he tried to get me in trouble telling him about our pop business because well, we weren't supposed to be doing that. Uh, right. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. So I go, I know who told you that. That fucking Johnny Garino told you that. So just by coincidence, I had no money on me that night. Like I came out of my house, I had no cash on me. I don't know how that happened. It was just like a coincidence. And I said, I'm a big marijuana dealer. And I went in my pocket, I got five cents to my name, right? <laughs> he goes, I said, I got five cents to my name, look, right? So he's staring at me, he don't say nothing. We get to, Rich, to 101st Avenue, the Richie Gotti's Cafe, and we walk in and he walks up to my father. He goes, you know your son only has five cents in his pocket? So my father looks at him and goes, my son will never be broke as long as I'm alive, right? So we, now we have a drink and this and that and bop, 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 bop. About an hour later, I'm leaving, right? I'm walking, this, I'm walking out. This is what kind of guy he was. I'm walking out the door and I hear him go, oh, wait a second. John Gotti, wait a second. I stop. He walks up to me. He hugs me and he sticks his hand in my pocket, right? He hugs me and sticks his hand in my pocket I walk out of the club, Richie Gotti's Cafe. I go in my pocket, five $100 bills. From from John Gotti or Richie? Richie. No, no. John. I was in Richie's Cafe. Oh, wow. I was in his, yeah. He hugs me, and he sticks his hand in my pocket. I walk out of the, the club, Richie Gotti's Club Cafe, and I go in my pocket, and five $100 bills he stuck in my wow. pocket. 
Those are those are some neat stories, right? <laughs> you know about John Gotti Sr. and you know a lot of people criticized him for being too flashy in the Teflon Don. But you know to hear these stories, to me that's always what I thought La Cosa Nostra was about is is really yeah. looking after your people. You know. Yeah, but it it's not that way no more. You saw a lot of the cracks in the in the porcelain. You saw a lot of the treachery as you got deeper in the game and. You know, an incident occurred, and it's it's a well documented incident revo- regarding this kid Frankie, who was a dangerous guy. He was a armed uh, truck robber, and he got in with your sister, and he turned your sister out, got her strung out on dope, and an incident occurred where at your sister and and Frankie's wedding day. Oh, my my nieces, my. Sister's baby shower. Your sister's baby shower. Your mom put up all the dough for the shower. She even paid for the open bar. But at the end of the night, the bartender comes up to your mother and says, by the way, there's a $700 tab here. And your mom goes, wait a second. I I, I had an open bar. He, she says, well, the bartender says, well, Frankie was ordering everybody drinks and being a pig and, and, and being obnoxious ab- about it. So there's a $700 tab. When your mother, your sweet mother, confronts Frankie, he puts hands on her. Yeah. So I was in treatment when that happened. So the next morning, the morning after the Christmas, the, uh, the next morning after the after the baby shower, I called up my wife Alice because she lived upstairs from my mother. We lived upstairs, and, my, and I and I asked her just to find out, make sure everybody had a good time and everything. And uh, I asked her, you know, how was the party? She goes, how was the party? You don't know what this guy did. I came home, I heard screaming and yelling and your mother screaming. I ran downstairs. You had your mother on the floor. He was choking her. I jumped on his back. I had, I scratched his face. He threw me up against the wall. He, he ran out of the house. I go, are you, I'm I, like, now I'm like shocked. I'm going, are you kidding me? I said, I, I couldn't believe he did something like that. So I, I'm in treatment. I didn't leave. I wanted to finish because I had to address my issues. I got out of treatment and um, I went to see my father's partner, Tony Lee. And I told him, you know, this guy beat my mother up. And he said, yeah, I know. I said, you know. I said, well, what are we going to do? He goes, we're going to clip him. What do you think we're going to do? And that was the beginning of, the, of, the, of, of it, you know, because we knew he was dangerous. And then other stuff, we found out other things he was doing. He was taking money off my mother. He was shaking her down. He, he took her to the bank to make her withdraw money. Yeah. He hit her in the head once with his beeper. He threw his beeper at her. And you could see my mother was in fear like, I would go home and I would t- ask my mother something and she would say, stay away from him. He's crazy. He'll hurt you. Don't go near him. You know, so she was living in fear with this kid. And um, I would come home and her VCR would be taken apart. And I would go, What's, what, who, what happened to your VCR? She goes, oh, please. They, he, he thought there was a bug in it. He must have been smoking crack. He got paranoid. He took my, my mother's VCR apart. So it was just a whole bunch of things yeah. building up, building up. And, uh, and then, um, you know, and then Tony Lee, you know, and, and then I went to see my father. And um, the first words out of his mouth, he goes, when I told him what happened, he goes, what, do you, what does this guy think I'm dead? I go, evidently, he doesn't really care, you know. And, uh, and, and we ta- I told him what the plan was, and he okayed it. And then uh, John Gotti okayed it, and that was it. People in our life know the deal there's rules they know to like i know like like listen wise guys daughters boys cat they wanted to go me i, I want to go out with them you know uh, um you know I, I you know when you when you put some you know i have i have friends of mine that went out with wise guys wives that got killed right and there was a yeah. rumor floating around that victoria Gotti had a little crush on you is no. that Angel. Angel Gotti did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, Angel, Angel had a crush on me. Yeah. When she was a kid, she did. She had a crush on me. Even Arneel's daughter, Tony. She, Arneel Della Croce's daughter. I was great friends with her, her and her brother. She she was, you know, we were great friends. She used to beg me to take her home. And I, I would always make someone drive, come with me. Smart you know, move. She yeah. had, you know, guys that went out with her got married. And my friend, not my friend, this kid, Louis Baja, that hung out with me, was fooling around with her. And I told him a hundred times, listen, Louie, stay away from her. That's Arneel's daughter. And he got killed. Another, you know, like, this is the deal. You don't, you just don't do shit like that. And Frankie, he knew the deal and he did it anyway. So walk us through now. Now Frankie's crossed the line, man. He basically signed his death warrant. And you, you tell a story about how you had to play the role 
that you had a score lined up for him to set him up for the clip, right? Yeah, so what happened was, so we knew he was a thief. He was an armed truck, uh, armored truck robber. He was always looking for scores. And uh, so we had to figure out a way how to do it because it was like he was, like I said, dangerous. So, you know, you just couldn't roll up on him. So we t told him that we had a score for him. Uh, well, I didn't tell him, I told him Tony Lee had a score for him in uh, in South Ozone Park. Uh, it was supposed to be an alleged uh, safe house, drug dealer safe house with his money. So uh, we told him that, uh, I told him Tony Lee wanted to talk to him about it. And uh, I would come pick him up the next day. And, uh, and um, the next morning I went, I picked him up and I brought him to Cafe Liberty. And uh, that's where, it, and that was it. Now, how, now, how in God's good green earth did Frankie not think he was going to get clipped? Was he that high on drugs that he thought, oh, I'm just going down the street with Anthony? You know, I mean, did he know it was coming or not? I think he just underestimated me. I think he I think he didn't think that I told anybody the, about the incident with my mother because, uh, you know, um, he just underestimated the whole situation because he, he, he came willingly and he had no suspicions of anything. And, uh, you know, I just think he underestimated the whole situation. Right. So you you have you drive down the road and you're going to rendezvous with your crew and Skinny Dom is one of the fellas, right? Yeah. Who's actually the guy who who put a hot one in a few hot ones in mm. uh, Frankie's head and body. <laughs> Describe the moment when you walked Frankie into the house, right? A club. Uh, it was a club. You walk him into the club and uh, you're greeted by Skinny Dom, right? No, what happened was I pulled up on Liberty Avenue and I parked across the street and Mikey Gal, Tony Lee's brother, was sitting outside the outside the building on a chair because it was a summer day. Um, and we got out of the car and I crossed Liberty Avenue with Frankie and Mikey got up and kissed us hello. And Frankie walked in ahead of me. And as I walked in behind Frankie, I heard Mikey Gal, he locked the door from the outside and I heard the door click. When I heard the door click, I got a little nervous. And when I walked in, so there was a bar, a countertop, and uh, at the bar was Tony Lee, Skinny Dom, and this guy, Freddie D. Congilio. They used to call him Freddie Hot. And they had uh, bagels on the table, and they were eating bagels and drinking coffee. And we walked up, and Tony says, you want some bagels? And I made a bagel, and then I ate the, and I was eating the bagel. And then Tony Lee told me and Frankie, come in the back. I, oh, he told Frankie, you want some tomatoes? I got, because he had a garden in the backyard. And he said, yeah, definitely. So Tony Lee says, come on, let's go in the back. I'll give you some tomatoes. So we went in the back in the yard and we were in the yard and he was talking about his garden and Tony and he picked some tomatoes and he put them in a brown paper bag and he handed them to Frankie. And then as we were walking in back into the club, the back room, Tony grabbed Frankie's hand and said, yeah, wait, I want to talk to you. And I just kept walking and I walked out. And when I walked out, I looked at Dominic and I gave Dominic the nod and Dominic reached underneath the countertop and took out the pistol and he put it behind his back and he just walked into the back and then I just heard pop, pop, pop. I just heard the shots go off and then Dominic came back out and he was frazzled. He goes, this fucking guy don't want to die and he put more bullets in the gun and I looked and I saw Frankie laying on the floor and then Dominic went back in and just stood over him and shot him a few more times and that was it. Wow. And then Tony Lee came out and told me, all right, just leave, go do what you got to do, make out, you know, nothing happened and I left. And how'd you feel driving away from that scene? Did you feel weird? Did you feel, were you like doing damage control in your head? How do I explain this to my sister? Because they're going to call looking around for Frankie now. I I really didn't, it didn't even phase me. It was another the only day. Part, the, only, the only part that, the only time I felt a little nervous was when I heard the door lock behind me. And, uh, and I knew what was going to happen after that. I knew I would have to go see my sister and all that. So I was ready for that. And it didn't, no, it didn't even phase me. And it, it but when you heard that me. lock behind you, that door lock, you, you, this is real now. Yeah, that's yeah. when I got that's a little nervous. That's when this is yeah. real. But yeah. then it passed. Then it passed. Then, then I, went, I, I worked, actually worked in a number office and I went to work. And my, then a couple hours later, my sister called me and said, Frankie never came home. And then I went, that, this is when it gets like really weird. Yeah. yeah, you know, because now I go by her house and now his parents are there. Oh, man. And I walk in the house and his mother's there and his father's there. And this his partner, Peter Sakara, is there, who's a killer. 
he's there and they're asking me what happened. I go, I don't know what happened. He, we, Tony Lee talked to him. I dropped him off on the, I dropped, I, I dropped him off around the corner. He made <laughs> I mean, a phone call. I don't know where the fuck he is. I dropped him off on your street corner. He told me someone was coming to pick him up. I don't, you know, I'm, and I'm, you know, we had a whole story planned. Right. So the father wanted me to drive. So I, now I'm, now I'm in the car and I'm driving around looking for him. So you're playing it off like, where's yeah. Frankie? Frankie, yeah, I'm driving him, now yeah. I'm driving around looking for him with the father and Peter Sikander. I'm driving oh, around man. looking for him. And, uh, you know, and then this went on. And then they then they came to the club. The father and Peter Sikander came to the club to, you know, to talk to Tony Lee. And then they, they kept coming. And finally, one day, Tony Lee just told them, listen, don't come here no more. I don't know where your son is. I don't right. know what happened to your son. Don't come here no more. He gave them a little respect. Hey, right. okay, I don't know where he is. Right. But they started coming again and again. Right. Yeah. And then Tony Lee chased them, basically. And then what happened was after, this is what got me in trouble years later. So what happened was Tony Lee chased them. Don't come here no more. I don't know where your son is. Stay away from here. Don't come here. And a couple of days later, I'm standing in front of the club and Peter Sakara pulls up, his partner. Who's a psychopath right. too. Yeah. He pulls up and I tell him, didn't Tony tell you to stay the fuck away from here? He goes, well, you know, he was my partner. I said, let me let me ask you a question, Peter. I said, and he's looking at me, he goes, you know what? I said, if someone went to work on your mother, what would you do? Oh, wow. And he just looked at me, and that was it. He never came around. That statement. He got the picture. But wait, 20 years later, he cooperates with the government, and wow. that statement got me indicted for murder. The story I heard it was that he was dumped in the Atlantic Ocean, Frankie, and you guys had to puncture his lungs, open up his belly, so he went float up to the surface. Is that all true, or is yeah, that just Tony Lee? The toad, that was uh, yeah. They took I I wasn't on the boat, but Tony Lee was on the boat. They took him out. This guy Tommy had a boat. They took him out on a boat, and Tony Lee punctured his lungs and punctured his stomach, and they. Put him in the ocean. Yeah, they put him in the ocean. Now, your sister, she she grew up in the life, around the life, right? She had to have put one and two together, right? Or eventually. I or think she was in denial of it. I mean, she always had a feeling that it was us. But, I, you know, like, she, I mean, I, later on, I told her, you know, I told her and my mother the truth what happened when I left New York, you know, when I decided to cooperate and I left New York. I, told, I, I sat them down and I told them and my mother... My sister started screaming at me, you know, and all that. She flipped out. But my mother just sat there and she just looked at me and she said to me, um, I can't believe that your father made you do things like that. Listen, we, you know, I, I went out for dinner with people that I knew were dying. I mean, I went out with people that I knew that, they, you know, were having dinner on a Monday and I knew like Wednesday my father was going to kill them. You know what I mean? Like that was just the life people, people were in. You know, that was how we were raised and that was the job. Like they call murder work. Explain to us, just normal civilians, how you can sit with someone you know is going to get whacked and have, you know, po share pasta with them and have a good time. Are you laughing? Is it a normal day? Yeah, it's I mean a normal day. Listen, before my brother-in-law got killed, a, a week before he got killed, we had a, a christening for my niece. And in the and 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 in the and, and at the christening, he came over to see us and say, sit down with us and had a drink with us. And when he walked away, Tony Lee leaned over to me and goes, uh, "He should only know what's going to happen to him in a couple of more days." Wow. Yeah, no, that's the that's the somber that's the part life. of the life. Yeah. yeah, no, that's that's the chilling part, if you will, you know. But it is what it is, man. Yeah. And you know, you you talked about having a, a cocaine problem, and what I learned from you, which I found interesting, is a lot of wise guys kept a little booger sugar <laughs> on them, man. Was that was that a normal thing? Would you guys do a little blow or a little sniff? Was that accepted? Eric, listen, in the seventies. Everybody was blowing coke. I mean, everybody. I mean, everybody was blowing, you know. I used to go to this club, the Hippopotamus. It was uptown in Manhattan in, in the very early 70s. You went in there and everybody was blowing coke. I mean, even captain, the mate guys. Everybody, everybody. What My about father used to tell me, 
He goes, oh, we in the hippo last night, sticking that shit up your nose. And I would tell him, yeah, you should only know who was standing next to me. He goes, I know them dirty son of a bitches. <laughs> <laughs> would John Gotti do a little booger no, sugar? I don't no, never, I never saw him do any. I but, never, I, where was the, the cutoff with, with some of the, like your father's era, they weren't doing blow. No, they were drinkers. Yeah, they John were, was a big drinker. My father was a big drinker. John Gotti? Yeah. yeah. What but was they, his drink? What was John Gotti's Martinis. He was martini. a dirty martini yeah, he guy. He was a martini guy. What was your drink? Back in the day, me Scotch. I was a Doers White Label guy. Doers yeah, White Label. Yeah, yeah, I was a White Label guy. But yeah, everybody was doing coke. You know, that was the era. It was, you know, in the seventies, everybody was blowing coke, and then, and then it just became you know an issue. You know what I mean? So for some sure. of us, you know, um, you're doing it, and you're doing it, and you get caught up in that lifestyle, and then you know it became an issue with me. And my father had gotten arrested, and you know a lot of stuff started happening, right. and 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 it just became an issue. And then I just knew that. You know, I started losing some self-respect. I started losing some street creds, you know what I mean? And John was the boss and uh, at the time, and I just knew that it was time to stop or die. It was either one or the other. You know, it was affecting me um, physically and, and mentally and spiritually. You know, I was, I was just... Um, not feeling good. It was tearing you up. Yeah. yeah, it was tearing me up. It was, and uh, and I knew that it was time to address it, and and I thank God I did. How long have you been sober, Anthony? January twelfth would make thirty four years. Wow, congratulations! Thank you. Yeah, and and even now you can't just have a glass of wine. It'll it'll trigger you, right? In the past, alcohol always led me to cocaine. So can I have a glass of wine now? Maybe, but am I willing to take that risk? And I'm not willing to take that risk. So I believe in if I, you know, I believe that addicts should be totally abstinent from all mind and mood altering substances. And alcohol is a substance that alters your mind. Sure, it does. You right. Know? So I think total abstinence would be like the best, you know, would be is the best way for me to go. Right. Yeah. And and that's always the best policy. Now, you know the the wise guys always had a little blow on them. They were moving blow weight, big powders, big time. Big time. So that also drew in all the girls, all the celebrities. Oh yeah, you know. And you, <laughs> I mean, you you talk about stories where you're hanging out with Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra. Uh, well, and, that's that, that's who my father hung out. With. I right. hung out with guys like David Bowie, Keith Richards, Andy Warhol. Wow. You know, my father. Walked into a club one night in the, like 1980. Me and my brother were in a club and we used to hang out in this club called the Ritz. It was and now it's Webster Hall, but back in the, the very very early 80s, it was called the Ritz. It's in was Manhattan. that in, yeah Manhattan? Yeah, it yeah. was a rock club and and all the celebrities went there. And one night, you know, I'm sitting in there drinking and snorting coke. Me and my brother Andy Warhol, Billy Idol, it's and crazy. my father walks in. He catches sees us, you know, like. Um, David Bowie, I'm getting high with David Bowie, drinking with him. Uh, it was just a crazy scene. And, you know, we were out all the time and we, you know, people knew who we were. They loved to be with us, you know, and uh, Keith Richards used to call my house up and my mother used to say, who's this English guy that keeps calling here? <laughs> Keith Richards. He used to call looking for my brother. Man. And we weren't with Coke dealers, but we always had Coke dealers hanging out with us right. that wanted to be around us. So we always had Coke on us and, and they knew they could trust us. You weren't going to take photos right. for sure. Yeah. Right. Listen, one night I'm at, I'm one night I'm in the Ritz and I'm out, I'm with a, on a date with this girl named Jenny. Now I know her name because that's my mother's name, so I never forgot her name. Her name was Jenny and I'm sitting there in the Ritz and the place is packed. And my table is roped off because I'm in the VIP section up on the balcony. And the owner, Stanley London, who was a friend of ours, my father's, comes over to my table and goes, I have such a problem. You have to help me. So I say to him, Stanley, what's the matter? What happened? He goes, Diana Rush just called. I have nowhere for her to sit. Could she please sit at your table? <laughs> I said, of course Diana Rush could sit at my table. Now the girl is with me. She, she says, she says, did he just ask you if Diana Rush could sit at your table? And I said, I'm the celebrity in here. I was teasing her. And Diana Rush came and sat at my table. That's insane. You know, and so, you know, but... It was great at the time, but when I, when I look back on it, I, that was all the process of me getting caught up in that lifestyle and 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 all that, you know. So wow, wow. So Rouge, you talk about a lot of the celebrities just being attracted to the mob guys. They always had the best blow. They had the chicks, and all all the VIP access. And you mentioned you partied with Andy Warhol. Did you ever like ask him for a piece of art, or did you did you realize? the gravitas of Andy Warhol when you were in that mode? You know, 
No, because, you know, so I'm hanging out in this club called The Ritz, which now is Webster Hall. Andy Warhol used to come up there, and I got introduced to him, and he would sit with us, and he would snort coke with us, and he would drink with us, and, you know, and, and I would go to his loft, and, you know, and he would give stuff away. Like, I would see him take a napkin and draw something on it and give it to somebody. Today, them things are worth millions. Who knew back then? He would paint, draw a Marlboro box or a Campbell soup can. Like, who knew? Like, back, my, my, I just wasn't in the right frame of mind. Like, it was a party. Like, I was out there partying, and, and I just couldn't see what the, the gist of it was. And uh, so I never took anything. But I could have took anything I wanted off him. And to this day, me and my brother, we always talk about it like, what idiots we were. We could have gotten anything we wanted off the guy, and we never took anything off him. We just hung out with him. Right. Like, even my father met him one night with us. He came up to the Ritz one night, and he, he was sitting with us. And my father said, who's this guy? You know, because he had the hair, you know, this way, you know. And my father goes, who's this guy? And he went, I'm Andy. And then he just, like, got up and he left me. Andy, I said, that's Andy Warhol. He goes, who the fuck is Andy Warhol? That's a trip, man. Yeah. And, you know, your father had his celebrity hangarounds, you know, from Dino Martino to, yeah. to Frankie Sinatra. Sinatra. Yeah, Frankie what, Valley. What, what, what's the deal with Sinatra? I, You know, I heard he was a bad drinker. Drinker, but was he was the rumor that he was a made guy was that well, ever verified so my father used to go to Jilly's all the time that was where Sinatra whenever Sinatra was in Manhattan he always hung out on Jilly's that was his guy Jilly that was one of his main they claimed that was his bodyguard so my father would always go there and and Frank Sinatra would always send Jilly over to my father to come sit with him and my father didn't want to sit with him and I used to tell my father why don't you want to sit with this guy and he told me because he's a bad drinker and I heard that when he gets drunk, he abuses people. And if he starts abusing me, I'll knock him off the chair and then I'm going to have a headache. So my father didn't want to sit with him. Eventually, my mother was there one night with him and my father wound up sitting with him. And, uh, you know, they liked each other. And, and then my father started sitting with him later all the time after that when he ran into him. And my father told me the rumor was that he was straightened out, but he didn't know if it was true or not. But that was the rumor. He was technically what on record with guys out of Chicago. That's what my father told me. Interesting. Now, w w when Frankie asked your pops, he says, Frankie goes, who's your favorite singer? What'd he say? Yeah, so they're sitting at the table and Frank Sinatra leans over to my father, goes, Andy, who's your favorite singer? So my father goes, who's my favorite singer? Mario Lanza. So my Frankie go Frank Sinatra goes, Mario Lanza, what does he have that I don't have? And my father like just laughed and goes, come on, Frank, you know, Mario Lanza, come on, man. What are you kidding me? Mario Lanza. He loved my, my father yeah. loved Mario Lanza, Joe DiMaggio, and Rocky Marciano. If you said anything bad about those three guys, you had a problem. Yeah. Like those are his three idols. Yeah. I remember my grandmother loved Mario Lanza. That yeah. was the guy. My you father know. used to play his records and then, then interpret all the Italian words to me. Those were the good days, you know, but you know, with, with every good, there's a bad and, and, you know, towards the end of, of your, your, your mafia career, if you will, you start to realize that your co-defendants in the Frankie murder, which you get charged for in what, 2005? Yeah, I got out of prison in 04. You know, it started happening when my father died when I was in prison. I got out of prison in 04. Um, and then about uh, maybe 10 months later, I got arrested for, I got arrested for a murder. Um, when I got arrested for the murder, nobody was really looking out for me. Um, my co-defendants weren't looking out for me. Um, I needed, I, I was working, um, I was waiting to get straightened out. I was waiting for them to have the ceremony, which they didn't have yet. And, um, I was working, driving a truck actually when I got arrested and, um, I needed 25,000 for an attorney. Nobody wanted to help me. Um, and finally an attorney to, that was going to do my my motions came up with something that might help me um with the time frame to get one of the predicate acts thrown out of the rico which would be the murder so they needed help from my co-defendant's attorney so they called up my co-defendant's attorney and asked for this the help and my co-defendant's attorney told them no which means in legal words, they were gonna dump the whole thing right. on you. And this attorney told me, listen, they're gonna throw you under the bus. You need to call the government. And I said, what are you crazy? I can't do that. They said, no, you need to call the government. They're gonna throw you under the bus. You know, I couldn't even make the call. You know, it took me 
a year to make that call, and I still didn't make the call. I had a card of an agent's name, and I gave the card to my wife, and I told my wife, when you get to work, make this call, and and she did, and that, and that was it. And this is a mob attorney that's giving you that advice. Yes. When he says, hey, it's yeah. time to tuck and roll. Yeah, you know, yeah, Ugh. and you know, but... They, you know, they were good friends with me. They loved my father, you know, and and uh, and they knew, you know, I knew at that point that life was over. You know, I did 14 years in prison. Nobody was looking out for me. My father was dead. John Gotti was dead. Tony Lee was dead. Everybody I cared about was dead. The the, the people out there weren't the same. The mob wasn't the same. Um, and I hit the bottom. It was like drugs. Like I woke up one day and I was done using right. And I woke up one day and I was done, you know, being a criminal. I was done with the mob. And, you know, and that was the hardest thing I ever did to do that. I mean, to this day, sometimes I still regret it. You know, um, it still bothers me sometimes sure that does. I did that. Yeah. But you know what? But um, I did it. And, and you know, and, and I changed my whole life around, you know. And now I'm finally content. You know, I went back to school. I became a counselor at a treatment center. Your you relationship know, with your family. I have a improved. great relationship with my family, you know, and 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 I don't have to worry about uh, hurting anybody anymore or you know getting arrested anymore. So it was a big change, right? And you, you, your your father, Fat Andy Ruggiano, was known for holding his mud. He always took it on the chin. You did your whole career. If F Fat Andy, your father, and John Gotti Sr. were still alive today, would you have rolled or no? Never. Yeah. Never. You know, and that's a, that's a good question. I like that question. You know why? Because that's why I could look in the mirror today. Because anybody that really knows me, that knows me from back in the day, that really knows me, they know for a fact that if my father was alive or Tony Lee was alive or John Gotti was alive, I would have never cooperated. I could have never done that to them. I believe that. Never. I would've, and, and that's why I could look in the mirror because that was the hardest decision I ever made. It took me literally a year of picking up the phone and hanging it up, picking up the phone and hanging it up. And even when the call was made, I still couldn't make the call. I gave the card to my wife to make the call because I still couldn't bring myself to make the call. And what saves me today is that I know if they were alive, I would have never made that decision and maybe I would have been okay and maybe I would be spending the rest of my life in jail. But at that moment in time, you know, they weren't around and, and that was the decision I needed to make. Right. No, I, I, no one could be mad at you and for all the guys on the comment boards with the rat emojis and all that, you know That's what? Right. Walk a mile in your moccasins, and That's then make and then make that decision whether to send that rat emoji, you know. And it drives me nuts because a lot of the guy, the biggest criticism is why are all these rats on the show? And this, <laughs> yeah. well, you want to hear the mob stories? Well, darn it, you got to hear yeah. it from a guy who's proffered because you're not going to hear it from an active guy, right. you know. And 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 you know, I, I I have you know, there's a lot of reasons why I do this. I do this because people are interested in it. And I do this to show people that, you know, you could change. You know, 100%. you could change, you know, you know, you could change, you could get, and that life, listen, yeah, I had a great time at one point, and then I didn't, you know, there's, there's Italian kids out there that think the mob is all that, the mob ain't shit. The good news is you've got a great podcast, which we love, Reform Thank Gangsters. You. Reform Gangsters. On YouTube. We're on loving YouTube. that show. And subscribe, it's, subscribe. <laughs> hit that subscribe button. It's growing. Yeah. And then we've got, you're going to be on, um, you're you're going to be on the next Fear City installment. Right, Fear City 2. We already, that's already being edited right now. Um, that should be coming out. I, 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 they told me at the beginning of the new year, which I'm very excited about. And uh, I'm also working on a script with, uh, with Leo Rossi, the actor. Oh, wow. We're working okay. on a script about my life. That That's in the process of... What, what, what would you title your movie, just out of curiosity? Well, we don't have a title yet, but uh, that's up to Leo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, but that's in the works. And uh, and yeah, everything. And, uh, and uh, I'm also involved with Face to Music. Which is like a, a 501c3 that's doing treatment and you integrate right. music. Right, what that and is, it's a charity. It's called Face the Music. Um, it's run by a fellow named Paul Pellinger. And what that is, we it's a it's a charity um, to pay for people's treatment because people that don't have insurance that can't get into treatment centers to fight addiction, uh, we pay for their scholarships through through the charity. So because uh, nobody should be denied treatment just because they don't have money or insurance. Right. And I love that, man. That's a beautiful thing. And then how can our audience reach you? Do you do you interface with people that are looking for some help, man? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go to yeah. my website, anthonyrugianojr.com, 
or reform gangsters. And there's uh, actually a, a helpline number there, which has been, um, thankfully, it's been getting a lot of calls lately, which is really good. Just And there's a number there for a, for a help center. And call that number, and uh, they'll connect you to the foundation. Right. And, Rouge, you have a unique story because you were literally, you came out the womb with a hand-painted tie and a fedora. You were born <laughs> into the whole I thing. I like that. Yeah, for sure. But but what what would you tell a young kid in, in, in the impoverished areas of America and across the world that are on that fence that are like, should I go? This way or that way, what's your, what's your little stamp and advice to these youngsters? My stamp and advice would be all that glitters isn't gold and get an education, take it from me, get an education and work hard. And at the end of the day, you'll be content. Do not, you know, all that, you know, all that instant gratification is, is not going to work in the long term. And, you know, like I was told, all that glitters isn't gold. And that's the truth. 